Thank you. Um, thanks for having me today. I uh, have provided um, kind of an overview for you of this topic. It's very dense. It's, there's a lot of emerging research now. Uh, and I've tried to give a high level approach so that you know a little bit about all the areas that are of importance right now. Uh, you can interrupt me at any time with questions. I'll stop frequently throughout the talk to answer questions so that um, we have an opportunity to, because this really, I think, um, is a topic that is uh, important for conversation. Um, so let's get started. So really today, I want to give you an overview about what we call anxiety now. It's still a psychological diagnosis. Um, but more and more research is looking at other bodily systems that are involved in what we call anxiety. So I'll give you some nutrition strategies for addressing manifestations in adults. I primarily uh, began my work working with children um, and then I started working with their parents and their siblings. Uh, so I have experience working with mothers, with um, adults across a variety of issues. Um, and I hope that this information is relevant to you and um, meets what your expectations are for today. So. And the last thing I really want to talk about this, this evening is sleep. I don't think we talk about addressing sleep issues when we talk about anxiety enough. And unless we treat the sleep component of anxiety, I don't think that we get to the core of some of the concerns. So what is anxiety? This is the current DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for anxiety. Uh, and a generalized anxiety disorder, number one, uh, represents the presence of a constant worry or fretting on a specific topic or topics for a period of at least six months. It also involves three additional symptoms, um, being tired, being fatigued, having low energy, having a sense of restlessness, suddenly and be um, becoming irritable in an out of character sort of way, uh, decreased concentration and focus so that you're no longer able to participate in your activities of your normal life. So any school, any work, difficulty sleeping as I mentioned, and uh, somatic issues. So issues with bodily aches and pains and general malaise. Uh, are all components of an anxiety diagnosis, and three of those last symptoms must be present for a diagnosis to be made. But the physical experience of anxiety is what my focus is, and that is looking at the components that affect the body, the dizziness, the some people faint, GI upset, which takes all forms, headaches, muscle tension, a rapid heartbeat, so that pounding in your chest or a shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or a tightness in your chest. Um, all of these are components that are very real. Uh, people who experience acute forms of anxiety, like panic attacks, have many of these symptoms. So other uh, disorders that fall in the anxiety category are obsessive compulsive disorder, panic disorder, which is that panic attack that I mentioned, uh, PTSD, and social anxiety. Those are all different classes of anxiety, uh, but still um, uh, they fall under the anxiety umbrella, but they have different diagnostic criteria than generalized anxiety disorder. So right now, how do we diagnose and intervene in anxiety? Um, Self-assessment is available at that screening tool noted there at the top for anyone who's interested. That's a generalized questionnaire that you can take online to get information about uh, your symptoms and how a professional would suggest you follow up for further diagnosis. Uh, clearly a complete evaluation by a psychologist who can offer a diagnosis is important uh, if, you're in, if you intend to get um, psychological care. And once that evaluation is completed, the development of a plan of care looks something like this, except for the one at the bottom in the parentheses. So a th therapeutic intervention is the number one recommendation, and that's typically cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, or a more intensive form called DBT. 
Counseling is also deemed to be beneficial and uh, depending on who you talk to, it's psychotherapy or talk therapy, any relationship driven um, therapy with a professional trained in dealing with anxiety can be beneficial. Medical management is needed, so there are prescription medications that, that are recommended. Um, that's outside the scope of what I want to talk about today, but there are uh, two classes that are primarily used. Uh, one for ongoing long-term care, SSRIs, or SSNRIs depending, and then um, short-term acute forms that you need for a specific trigger. Uh, and that would be something like Ativan. Um, and then there is a lot of training on self-care, but I would argue that we also need to be adding nutrition, and that's the component that I put at the bottom of the page. And this really is why. Um, the gut-brain axis over the past decade has drawn a lot of attention and it has been, um, it's been studied across different uh, scientific research centers. We're doing bench science research on this um, relationship and really the gut-brain axis is this bi-directional communication system between the GI system and the brain. And initially we thought it occurred along a single pathway, so we knew the vagal nerve played a role in the GI brain connection, but we didn't know about other uh, relationships. And now we know there's an immunological relationship, we know that there's this vagal nerve relationship, but we also know, and this is where the most current research is kind of driving us to look at other body systems, is that biochemical pathway. So that's um, this idea that the bacteria in your gut create their own neurotransmitters that can affect the brain. And the two, I think, important takeaways in knowing where we are in this now, if you look at this, this all comes from um, a paper that was published a decade ago, and it was projecting what research would look like in the future. And for me, where we are looking right now, we've kind of proven those first two points, um, somewhat proven the fourth, but right now we're really diving into what is a mother's um, GI tract and her gut microbiome, how does that affect a developing baby? And we're looking at um, how infectious, this is, there are many, many research studies looking at all different aspects of how GI health and what that bacteria, the microbiome looks like and how it affects the lifespan. So this, I hope, kind of gives you an image of the integration of what's happening in this. And I won't spend too much time on it because I think I covered the high level talk, but this is really a theory that was put out about 10 years ago that's held true. Um, we know that there's this back and forth and the key components for me in talking about how we are, how the, the gut, which is my focus in talking about the nutrition component today, um, are one, stress-induced changes in the GI tract, which can be infection, they can be um, environmental stressors, they affect all different components of the GI tract. So it can be a motility issue, it can affect your ability to produce the muco mucus lining of the GI tract, it can be a permeability issue. All of those things can play a role in um, decreasing your body, your gut's ability to do its job well and allowing the bacteria to produce something that will be harmful to your brain or alter your brain activity. And this is also a nice illustration, I think, of the circular aspect for me in this. So you have this, something goes wrong and affects the bacteria in the gut, the microbiota. So whatever it is, whether it's a continued use of antibiotics, uh, an infection that's bacterial or viral or fungal, any number of different things can inflame the GI tract. So you have this issue. And what happens in the gut is that you have a low-grade inflammation or sometimes an acute inflammation for a period of time that settles. Then you have chronic dysfunction. You have uh, either hypermotility or hypomotility. And then you have these chronic symptoms that develop. So constipation, diarrhea, headaches, 
And then what's happening simultaneously in the brain is that you have these neurotransmitters produced that alter behavior, and you suddenly have a psychiatric, what we call a psychiatric comorbidity, which in this instance would be anxiety. So right now, where we are a decade out from these original theories are, we've documented and we know that individuals who have a digestive disorder, so in adults, most often, this is irritable bowel syndrome. An adult with irritable bowel syndrome is also more likely to have anxiety. An individual who has a psychological anxiety diagnosis also has a higher rate of gastrointestinal disorder or disease. So it goes back and forth. And we know that in both of those groups, when digestive disorders improve, so you treat the gut, the psychiatric, the psychological issues improve as well. <clears throat> and we finally, and this is a given, but we have lots of research over the past decade that speaks to it, much, much of our population has this incredibly poor gut health today because we have an overuse of antibiotics, we have a heightened use of a variety of medications that impact the GI tract. We have herbicides who, which have impacted our, our food uh, over time. We have an incredible amount of stress on a daily basis that influences all of us, multiple infections, and our diets are often poor. This is really just another um, visual to tell the story in a different way uh, about bad gut microbes um, can equal increased inflammation in the GI tract. And ultimately, it's a poor quality of life, and we equate that with an anxious or uh, anxiety-ridden life as well. More and more books are coming out. These were both published late 2017, early 2018 on the use of and the treatment of uh, GI health in addressing um, food and mood issues. Uh, the one on the left, The Mind-Gut Connection, is written by Emron Mayer, who works at UCLA in California. It's a very good, e easy to access kind of roadmap in understanding these concerns and also treating them um, through food and nutrition. The one on the right speaks very much to the similar topic, but also goes, dives in deep, looking at specific strains of probiotics that are useful to target specific um, mental health concerns. So right now, these emergent beliefs about anxiety, and I tossed this in here because these are not necessarily related to GI health, um, but they are also the focus of certain research. So we know GI health is involved here, but we are also starting to look at inflammatory markers, other um, substances that are functions uh, that serve a purpose in the brain, such as glutamate. Uh, we, we're looking at all sorts of inflammatory markers, both uh, primarily neurological and also systemic. And this brain-derived neurotrophic factor is something that uh, it has emerged over the past decade as well. And I wanted to point out that in addition to the GI tract and the central nervous system, the brain, anxiety also involves, and the research is looking at, autonomic nervous system dysfunction, which seems to be more and more prevalent. Um, the HPA axis, which I'll talk a little bit about later, and that's really looking at um, the hypothalamus uh, and adrenal function, uh, mitochondria and supporting mitochondria for overall both cellular health and bodily health and our immune system. So any questions on that kind of big picture science overview? Yeah, I've got one. Uh, which way is the best uh, to change uh, the nutrition uh, to, uh, you know, to, to improve your psychological state? Or is, is it better to, uh, to change the psychological state and then you will change the nutrition? So I, I, the question is, is it better to change the nutrition first or the psychological state first? Yeah. And I would argue that um, you need to do both, ideally simultaneously. Yeah, but does it work uh, both ways? Um, so not necessarily, because it say, when you say change the psychological state, are you referring to seeking therapy and working with a medical practitioner and 
um, perhaps medication, because those don't necessarily trigger your need to treat dysbiotic bacteria in your GI tract. So th the gastrointestinal symptoms will not be addressed by the other two components. So addressing those gastrointestinal symptoms might. Does that answer your question yeah. a little bit? Any other questions right now? Okay, so now I wanna just go briefly through um, diet and anxiety and um, we know the microbiome is important in mental health. Uh, I touched on the ideas of inflammation and permeability <laughs> so we know that there are a number of different hits to the GI tract that can cause inflammation. Most notably those are um, a variety of infectious processes and also autoimmune disorders can also play a role here. Uh, so Crohn's disease or colitis can also create that inflammation that triggers this process and concern. Um, and the one that we haven't really, uh, didn't really talk about is this lack of biodiversity that we've noted and that is that those of us who have fewer strains and varieties of bacteria in our gut have uh, a tendency toward um, more concerns with anxiety than those who do not. So th the hope is that you have this very rich GI flora. Uh, and in fact, when we look at and research um, those who express concerns with anxiety or depression, we know that their field of flora is very narrow. We know that the vagal nerve offers this conduit of um, communication that we've known about for a while, and we now know that GI bacteria can produce multiple types of neurotransmitters that can also communicate with the brain. So a paper came out in February of this year that was um, published in Nature, uh, looking at um, the component of, the components of 534 different bacterial strains in over 2,000 people. And what they found is that over 80% of those 534 strains were communicating with the brain. They were producing bacteria that could and did communicate with the brain, which is kind of groundbreaking because it's the largest study and also the most significant result to date in this area. So how do we get here and why do we stay here? One of those reasons that we stay here and we have trouble getting out of it is that many of us at home consume this standard American diet that isn't very rich in good food at all. Um, and when I come here, I'm always amazed that your diet is very diverse and it is very natural and ours is not. Um, we don't get a lot of fruits and vegetables. We just don't. Uh, we have processed foods and families are so busy that breakfast is picked up on the way to school at McDonald's often and lunch is whatever the school cafeteria provides and it can also be processed food. And the snack after school is Cheez-Its or Oreos and a packaged juice drink. Um, and all of those things, and our families often either don't eat together or something that they eat is picked up at a restaurant on the way home. and we're paying more and more attention to this, but we still have a long way to go, I think, in making it, making an impact in a way that is medically, health-wise, um, improving the health of a majority of people. Uh, we have this um, huge sugar consumption issue in the U.S., uh, and sugar really is an inflammatory component in itself. So, um, inflammatory processes feed on glucose. And it, by giving the body glucose, we're just giving that inflammation more fuel for the fire. Um, just, uh, you know, a, a colleague recently pointed out that research that she's done um, looked at sugar intake over time. And in the 1940s and 50s, the U.S. population consumed about two pounds of sugar a year. Granted, that was post-World War II. Things had been rationed. We weren't consuming lots of processed foods at that time. But now, on average, anyone want to take a guess at how many pounds of sugar per year we consume? 156 pounds per person per year we consume. Um, and we don't need that. I mean, that, we just don't need that. 
Uh, so this truly, you know, it might look sort of outlandish, but I can point to a number of patients, a number of families, a number of friends, that this is, this is our diet. And nothing in there really is, um, I mean, you could argue, I think, maybe for the French fries, but if you look at the data, um, you know, we, we have data also from the USDA in the past 10 years that shows that 75% um, of Americans, the only vegetables they consume are french fries and ketchup, tomatoes and potatoes. That's where they get their vegetables. And um, so this isn't too far off the mark. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sad to say that, but I think this is a fairly realistic perspective for many of our diets. If I may, um, can you tell us what's the healthiest state in the United States of America? <laughs> and, or rather, the state with a completely different diet yeah, and the lowest sugar consumption. So the question is really about what's the healthiest state, which has the best diet, and which has the lowest sugar consumption. And I don't think I can accurately answer that. My hunch would be likely California, because our, our health trends tend to start there. The legislation there tends to drive that in some respects. Uh, and many of the clients that I work with from California come in with a heightened level of knowledge already. Their school districts do really wonderful things with food for the children that they serve, and many of our states learn from them. So, so this really we know and has been researched across diagnoses, and we know that this is a great starting point for food for those with mental health concerns. So. How many of you are familiar with the Mediterranean diet? So it really is this very clean diet that's built on lean protein, plant protein, and that is important because it provides the amino acids that we need for neurotransmitter creation. Uh, lots of fresh vegetables and some fresh fruit, and those provide the vitamins and minerals which are the cofactors that we need for the synthesis of those neurotransmitters. Whole grains, which provide both uh, support for bowel motility um, and also uh, components of complex carbohydrates that we need for overall health. This is something I think we don't talk enough about, and that's water. We all need lots, lots and lots of water, more water than you know, we consume. And uh, the research tends to tell us that our bodies need essentially one ounce of water for one pound of body weight. So how many of you, can anyone in here raise your hand and tell me that you drink that much water every day? Okay, um, so there, there's your takeaway. Try to go home and drink more water and stay hydrated. Um, and then we need lots of healthy fats. In the US, we don't eat fish. We don't eat a lot of fish at all. We're becoming more fish aware, but that's really our primary source of essential fatty acids. Um, and we need EFAs for brain development to help with our cellular level function and support, um, and we need to get those from um, some seafood consumption, but also nuts and seeds. So this diet looks a lot different than that diet, right? And so this really is the goal. Um, and I, I wish I could say that more of us are doing this, but when we start talking about dietary change and to address things like anxiety or other mental health concerns, this is the very first thing. You want to start thinking about what you're putting in to fuel your body because you're not only fueling your body, you're potentially fueling that bacteria that's in your gut um, and you're providing the building blocks to uh, support healthy neurotransmitter support in your brain. <clears throat> and why, why do we think, why do I think that this is the best starting point? Well, um, number one, it uh, decreases this impact, it has this negative impact on inflammation, so it dampens it down. Um, it eliminates the fuel source for the bad bacteria. So if we keep feeding it Dunkin' Donuts, that bacteria is going to continue to thrive. If we take that food source away, um, you may have this sugar craving, this sh you know, everybody who has a sugar concern, it's common to feel like you have to have sugar once it goes away. And for me, that's really the key that, okay, we really do have a problem because your body is craving that. And I don't know if you've seen any of the recent literature on sugar 
um, and, and its addictive qualities that's much like other things we know as uh, addictive um, components. But I think it's valid after watching it in clinical practice for a number of years, I think it's valid to be concerned about that. Uh, a Mediterranean diet versus an American diet does something like this for your blood sugar. If you follow that Mediterranean diet, your blood sugar kind of follows this nice arc. If you follow that American diet, your blood sugar does this all day long. And you feel it. You get jittery. You get shaky. You have these lows where you need to sleep. Um, and I think that the more we can do to balance things out and do this, the better we are and the healthier we are. Uh, we increase the health of the GI tract. I think I've covered that part of this. And we provide the building blocks for, for building those neurotransmitters. So any questions about that diet stuff now? Yeah, there are a lot of uh, diets. Yes. In world, I mean. yeah. uh, why did you choose exactly Mediterranean? So I didn't choose Mediterranean. Um, the Mediterranean one is the one that has the most research validation behind it. There are many others that we would use that you may or may not have, that you probably have heard of. The paleo diet is a really good one. Um, it's a step beyond Mediterranean. The ketogenic diet is a step beyond paleo, but then there are all kinds of versions of that. So the primal diet, the, is there anything that you're specifically thinking of in terms of that? No, I'm more interested in uh, why did you choose exactly this, uh, exactly this diet? Uh, is it like uh, the simplest or uh, the most common diet, why? So it is the most researched across disease and um, disorder, and that's why it's chosen. There's the most evidence out there to suggest it's a good starting point, and um, it's uh, also the the it's a a far cry from what we typically eat that has enough research validation to support it. Anyone else? So uh, I think that's a great question. Um, in terms of religious observation, sadly, we don't honor a lot of um, either Friday or ongoing um, respects to avoiding or abstaining from meat. Um, the churches there have moved away from that, even during Lent. Um, there is this resurgence that we avoid all meat products on Friday now, so there's this movement towards um, vegetarian Fridays but our churches really don't, um, they don't honor that historic uh, practice any longer. How does things like coffee and alcohol affect you? Are you going to go there? Really? No, I wasn't going to go there. I wasn't okay, going to go there. <laughs> um, so the Mediterranean diet actually speaks to reasonable inclusion of alcohol. Um, and reasonable being defined as no more than one glass five days a week. Um, and in terms of caffeine, we know as a neurostimulant that uh, many people are hypersensitive to it and we try to limit it. Um, but it's not really a component of any of the research other than when you're talking about an, anxi an anxiety diagnosis, you're told to avoid all stimulants that could exacerbate these concerns. Can you please outline the difference between the two sugars? You know, the sugar that you yet that you consume by eating, let's say, cake, and uh, the different one, you eat fruits or something, or you just add some sugar into your coffee? That's a great question. So uh, the question is to differentiate between types of sugar, and um, what we're learning from the research is we know and have known from the research that processed sugar is bad. So table sugar, white sugar that's been processed beyond what it looks like in nature isn't so great for us. Um, and it has this, um, this effect on our blood sugar because it's metabolized quickly and easily. But we've, we've also learned that whether it's cake or whether it's a roll or whether it is, um, y you know, pancakes, we're going to break it down into glucose just like that white sugar that we add to our coffee and that's not good for us either. 
uh, there is emerging evidence that is too early for me to speak to uh, concretely, but fructose, so fruit sugar is also being implicated in these blood sugar variables and um, the research is out. We don't really have anything to quote on how fructose or other sugars would be impacting GI health. We don't know that yet. The, it's primarily been looking at glucose and everything that breaks down into glucose. Anyone else? So, and, uh, what's your attitude towards uh, the use of food uh, supplements? My attitude towards good supplements? Okay, that's next. Because um, I personally uh, believe in the use of quality supplements with research backing their recommendation. So where do we start? What, the first thing for me really is looking at what's going in for fuel. So that's food and that's the first conversation that we have. The second thing we talk about is how do we heal what might be going on in the GI tract? And it's a lengthy conversation to talk about probiotics, but that's where we start. So what kind of fermented foods do you add in? You add in yogurt and kefir and kimchi and anything that has been fermented to uh, kombucha, anything that has a rich probiotic culture. Many, many, many studies across different diagnoses now look at the use of probiotics um, and they typically start with dosing probiotics before every meal. So treating that as an appetizer, as it were. Um, so a precursor to your food. So you put this rich bacteria into your body and then move forward. I just suggest that clients use probiotic rich foods throughout their day um, because they're, they're really good for us. Um, if we have laboratory data, we might look at antibacterial, antifungal, or and a parasitic approaches because all of those things create the infection that creates the inflammation that gets us here in the first place. So if we have any data that can drive treatment of those things, we can look at supplements or medication that might be useful. If we have an inflammatory or infectious process that has impacted the gut to the place that um, there are symptoms, so reflux, or um, stomach aches, or inability to digest food, we would be looking at adding things like bitters with meals, or digestive enzymes to help uh, digest and absorb the food that we're consuming, or betaine and HCL for stomach aches and pains and the ability to further digest the food. And if we have a documented inflammatory process, we might think about using things to support the lining of the gut all the way through. And that would be things like marshmallow root, L-glutamine, which is an amino acid, and colostrum. <coughs> so this is a lot of information and I'm gonna skip it because <laughs> um, you, but if you wanna take a picture of it and go back, if it's something that you're keenly interested in, this really outlines the strains of probiotics that we have documented evidence treat, they treat anxiety. Um, so they are the ones in most recent human and animal studies that we know change symptoms and are able to affect serotonin levels which affect anxiety. Other therapeutic nutrients that we talk about using are um, vitamin and mineral support. So wherever you are in the life cycle, there are quality uh, supplements out there that can um, dose broad spectrum support. So if you're um, an adolescent, if you're a young adult, if you have quality prenatal vitamins and you need prenatal care, uh, that's where you would that's a basic and fundamental care for me. I know that it is um, a somewhat controversial topic in the press and in the research literature, but honestly, um, I don't think any one of us, and certainly as an American from Austin, Texas, I know I don't have or meet all of my dietary needs every day, given what I know about our nutrient needs in the, in the long haul. I, I don't do that. I don't have eight to 13 fruits and vegetables in most days. I just don't, but we know that's what we need as adults. Um, and so if I can choose a quality product, that's where I start. Uh, the second thing we talk about are omega-3 fatty acids because our lack of fish in the diet is a concern. Uh, and we know they're anti-inflammatory, 
They assist with energy and mood. They've been researched for years in things like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Um, they help with cortisol management, so they uh, provide adrenal support. And we have lots of evidence in the literature. And Nordic Naturals, who is a, which is a company that uh, produces a variety of different essential fatty acids, has a, um, a, an online library of every paper that has ever been written using this. And you can easily find it if you're interested in learning more about that research um, across different diagnoses. The other things that I think about, and this is primarily to deal with that sleep issue that I mentioned, are 5-HTP and melatonin. I kind of see those as foundational care because I want anyone that I work with to be thinking about their sleep, and those would be dosed at night. And then we look at cortisol management, so using different things to manage adrenal function and, su and support that. Sorry, what is it? Um, okay, 5-hydroxytryptophan, oh, I can't think of the P. Okay. Uh, <laughs> it's a precursor to tryptophan. It's a tryptophan precursor. Is there another question out here? Okay. I also look at adding B vitamins on top of those. So that multivitamin that I mentioned um, really targets any deficits or deficiencies in a daily intake. But I look at loading vitamins that are known to support uh, anxiety levels. So that would be vitamins B6 and B12. Folate is also a big issue, which we um, typically dose in a methylated form. Magnesium is a wonderful mineral for support for anxiety, but interestingly, all of the research out there does not support that because it's not a standalone nutrient. It's synergistic and it has to be dosed with these B vitamins that I'm mentioning to do its job. If it's not, the results are you know, not good. So you really need to think about this as kind of a synergistic picture and make sure that these components work in tandem. Uh, zinc has been documented to help with anxiety and there are a number of different trace minerals such as selenium that are also important in overall health for anxiety. So looking at anxiety-specific targets, uh, tryptophan, which is an amino acid um, that was removed from the market. I don't know if any of you are aware of this or not, but we avoided tryptophan use for a long time because it's an over-the-counter supplement. Um, and it was recently brought back, probably in the last decade. Um, and we avoided it because it was uh, there was a scare with tryptophan dosing because it was a contaminated product. And so they, it was pulled entirely from the market for many, many years. But it's actually a very safe and effective amino acid when used appropriately. So HPA axis support is this support of the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal um, function. And L-theanine, also an amino acid, is very good at providing calming and regulatory support. Ashwagandha is an herb that's used for that purpose and magnolia bark is as well. These are called adaptogens. So what they do is help your body if you're overproducing something they dampen it down. If you're underproducing something they help sustain a, a, an appropriate level in your body. So they help your body adjust to normal appropriate function. They're, it's not actually a dose that you know, gets you to a certain level. It helps your body do its job on its own. And then we provide that anti-inflammatory omega-3 support that I mentioned. So now I want to talk a little bit about sleep and then I'll stop talking and if you have other questions we can go through them. Um, I really feel like this is a crucial component of care that we ignore because we're all so busy. Uh, each of us as adults should be aiming for nine hours of sleep a night. If we don't get nine hours of sleep a night, which is what the research tells us we need, you should do kind of a self-study and figure out what your body needs to function at optimum levels. And that can really be anywhere between, the research tells us, between seven and a half hours and 10 and a half hours. So you could, there's this swing, but the average is nine hours, and therefore that's how we've dictated everybody needs nine hours. And how do you do that? Well, we walk through clients talking about an evening routine and what that looks like. That means going to bed at the same time every night, getting off your iPhone, iPad, your computer, um, using blue, are any of you familiar with blue light blockers? 
So blue light blockers are something that have um, been popular in recent years, which are glasses that you can wear that block all the blue light from your computer. So in, in theory, you can use all of your devices and it won't uh, affect your brain in the way that it keeps you awake. Um, better, just turn it off and put it away for the time frame before your bed. Also look at things like mindfulness and meditation. So there are so many apps out there now, you, I don't even need to go through them, but the most um, popular one right now is this one called Calm, um, which uh, guarantees putting you to sleep in three minutes if you have trouble falling asleep. Um, I'm not quite sure what the guarantee is, but that's how they, that's their tagline. Um, there's also a product out now called a Dodo. Does anyone know what the Dodo is? So the Dodo is this interesting little device that came out about a year ago that um, projects light and sound uh, and helps you focus and meditate um, and also suggests that you fall asleep. And in fact, they have research behind their product to support its use. It, it's an inexpensive, I bought one, tried it, because before I talked to clients about it, I wanted to know and understand how it worked. And it actually works really well. And it's like, I don't know, $29? It goes forever. You can, you know, it's a battery operated, uh, very simple device that serves a great purpose, in my opinion. And then there are all things like yoga, tai chi, et cetera, that you can also try. So what about sleep? Well, you'll see, you'll recognize um, some of the nutrients that I've mentioned earlier, 5-HTP, tryptophan, and melatonin. How many of you are familiar with melatonin? It's become a fairly popular um, product that we use now. How many of you um, know, use it? How many of you use melatonin? So um, it's a very simple, very safe way to um, regulate sleep in your body. It produces serotonin, it's a precursor to serotonin, helps your body uh, relax. There are two forms, and this is the key really, if it's something that you wanna try, if you're someone who travels a lot, because it really does a great job in terms of helping you switch time zones, um, or you have trouble falling asleep or staying asleep. Different melatonin does different stuff. If you have trouble falling asleep and staying asleep, don't buy anything other than a timed release product. They're, they'll be labeled very clearly, but if you have both issues, so you wake up through the night, don't buy standard melatonin and think it's gonna help you because you'll use it once, you'll realize it doesn't help, and you'll never go back to melatonin, when in fact you can really benefit from it. Um, so you have to choose the right one. Standard melatonin absolutely helps you fall asleep for most people, and the thing that we don't, that we don't really talk about in clinicians is that um, it won't work if you don't need it. So if you're someone who can easily, felt like your body responds to melatonin if um, your serotonin production requires it. So some pe people often ask, can I overdose melatonin? Can I do, and, and the reality is no, you can't because your body won't use it unless it needs it. Other things that you can think about are uh, herbs, herbal teas, tinctures, and they're supplements that are available too. I caution the use of oral supplements unless they're highly regulated. I typically vote for teas or tinctures that are made by organic producers. Um, and any of these herbs are really good for part of that bedtime routine that I mentioned. So these are my takeaway thoughts for you on this very um, involved subject. Um, try to treat anxiety as a symptom of other physiological concerns. So I think that the psychological diagnosis is absolutely necessary in some circumstances, but I don't want that to um, detract from or keep you from thinking about the multi-system involvement that we know now. So that you're also thinking about things like diet, nutritional support, support for the adrenals, which could play a significant role here that we know about, sleep support, and lifestyle change. And that's it.